Before You is one of the many paintings on the theme of the battle between Russian regiments and the Tatar Mongol regiments. Guess who is where? Surprisingly, both battling sides look exactly the same. As we traditionally imagine Russian knights and heroes. How is this possible? But was it the Tatar Mongol invasion in Russia at all, or was this historical construct only invented by historians much later for a convenient explanation of completely different events and processes? You are on the channel Visioner, I will be grateful for your likes, which is great motivate me, and promote the channel. So, let's get started. A few years ago such a question would have caused wild bewilderment, but today, with more and more researchers beginning to question the Tatar Mongol hypothesis, it is emotionally easier for us to make an effort to analyze the pure facts without burdening them with established interpretations, in which a succession of authorities endlessly refer to each other, as if this in itself proves something. After all, if someone has believed a lie to be true for a very long time, it doesn't make it any truer. 1. Genetics Let's start with the latest discoveries in the field of na genealogy. It itself does not interpret or interpret anything, but simply shows the geographic distribution of various haplogroups, that is, common na markers that are passed on the male Y chromosome from father to son continuously, up to the most distant common ancestor. So, according to those studies, the carriers of Slavic, Baltic, Celto-Germanic, Scandinavian, Caucasian, Semitic, and some other haplogroups, in descending order, are represented among our countrymen, in this case we are talking about the central part of Russia, where the major ancient Russian cities were located. As for the traditional Asian haplogroups, their representation in the European part of Russia is close to zero. In other words, no trace which would be absolutely incredible in the case of the 300-year rule of the steppe nomads in our territories. On that, in general, the question of the Tatar-Mongol yoke can be closed, but there are other arguments. 2. Language in the Russian language are absolutely no borrowings from the Mongolian language. While the interpenetration of words is observed even in all just neighboring peoples, not to mention the cases when the territory is conquered by someone for several centuries. 3. Official documents There are no documents in the archives, written in Mongolian, which would somehow confirm the nature of the relationship between our peoples in those very times. Only a couple of labels for the reign, and they were found only in the 19th century in Western archives, and there are big doubts about their authenticity. The language of these letters, however, is also not quite clear. In general, neither decrees, nor letters, nothing is discussed about a mass spread of the Mongol or Tatar languages in the records management in Russia. Far more widespread was the same Arabic, which is explained by the issues of trade. For example, the well-known Athanasius Nikitin in his journey beyond three seas constantly switches from Russian to Arabic and back in the order of things. 4. Appearance of the Tatar Mongols It is interesting to pay attention to the portraits of Bati, Tamerlane and other Khans. Do you think they are Mongoloid? Turkish, Arabic and many other sources do not think so, openly depicting and describing them as Caucasians. A contemporary of the Mongol Wars, the Persian historian Rashid ad-Din wrote that Genghis Khan's family children were born mostly with grey eyes and blonde hair. Batyi's image is described by the chroniclers in similar expressions, fair-haired, fair-bearded, fair-eyed. Interestingly, when the Soviet Union uncovered the tomb of Tamerlane, and the scientists reconstructed his appearance from the skull, it was too European, so he was deliberately given Asian features, so that the result corresponded to the settled picture in the public imagination. 5. Supply, infrastructure and control suppose the Great Golden Horde did exist. Just imagine, it emerged completely out of nowhere, without any prerequisites either in terms of infrastructure, or even in terms of writing. And at once it conquered half of the world from the Asian steppes to Europe, and then it kept this status quo for several centuries. The variations on the how question are endless, and there are no answers, how were they able to provide their army of many thousands, up to 500,000 men by some estimates, with such a volume of swords, shields, arrows and other weapons, without having a solid forge and mining base? Or did they buy it all from the Russians, and then go to fight with them? Well, let's say they were buying from India or China, but with what? What could they offer in return except horses? How did they supply their army with food, not farming, not having permanent arable land, not having roads for the passage of carts with provisions? Such a huge mounted army just tramples the grass on the way, so that it cannot in principle be kept on pasture. Today, some historians say there were not 500,000, but only 30,000 men in the horde. Okay, which does not negate the previous questions. But in that case, how did they ensure control of the conquered territories? We have to think that the situation was tense along the front line, 
because the conquerors are not welcomed anywhere. But we are talking about thousands of kilometers, practically the whole continent. Any army would scatter and simply dissolve in these squares and would not be able to be present everywhere at the same time, suppressing the riots and uprisings. It is interesting that in the 16th century it took the Cossacks about 50 years to conquer Siberia, to pass through several thousand kilometers to Bakel with fights, leaving behind a chain of fortified prisons. At the same time, unlike the Tatar Mongols, they already had a strong centralized state behind their backs, which supplied them with all the necessary resources, and they encountered rather little resistance. The Tatar Mongols a couple of centuries earlier had supposedly gone the same way in the opposite direction in just a couple of decades, conquering much more economically developed countries. 6. Population size The current population of Mongolia is about 1 million people. According to the worldwide trend, the population is usually growing, which means that in the past it was much smaller than this figure. At the same time we know that already at that time no less than 1 million people lived in Russia, and the Slavs were considered to be skilled warriors, who, for example, were eagerly recruited for the Byzantine service. There is a discrepancy in terms of opposing forces. 7. Cultural blossoming, twinning, selectivity, and lack of material footprints, and here is another series of curious why questions. Why the invaders did not impose their culture, by the way, no one really knows what it was, and were extremely loyal to any local religions practiced by the population? Why did architecture, icon painting and many other areas of art flourish in Russia under the yoke? Was the situation favorable and was nothing more important on the agenda? Why these so-called Tatar Mongols did not burn all the cities on their way and seized only some specific and others left intact at the back of his army, going with a punitive campaign? Why are Russian princes constantly related to the Tatar Mongols, and vice versa, as if there was no confrontation, conquest, shameful tribute? By the way, the Tatar Mongols were not related to the European nobility. Why did the Tatar Mongols care so much about administrative order specifically in Russia? Batyi's invasion takes place in the midst of internecine wars, and he seems to have come to Russia purposely to streamline the mechanism of succession and suppress separatist sentiments. For example, during the Western campaigns against Europe, nothing of the kind happens the horde burns and loots cities, but does not introduce any labels for reigning, and does not build a vertical of power. And finally, why in the Mongolian sources themselves there is no evidence of the great conquests? There is no material trace of this empire in principle, for example, the famous center of the horde, the city of Karakoram, has not yet been found by archaeologists. Eight. Composition of the army and here are more curious facts to the general mosaic from our European friends, the Hungarian king describes the composition of the horde this way. When the state of Hungary from the invasion of the Mongols, as from the plague, for the most part was turned into a desert, and as sheepfold was surrounded by various infidel tribes, namely, Russians, Broders from the east, Bulgarians and other heretics from the south. I wonder the Russians and Brodniks, Aka Cossacks, so eagerly enlisted in the army of their conqueror and continued his campaigns? And where were the Mongols themselves at this time? 9. Cossacks. In a certain way the forerunners of the Cossacks can be considered the aforementioned vagrants, who lived in the same geographical area. Evidence of them as military detachments is already known from the Xi 13th centuries. There are also direct indications that they were encountered by foreign travelers at Batyi's stadium. However, there is absolutely no evidence that ever vagrant Cossacks clashed with the Tatar Mongols. How could they get into central Russia or Europe, bypassing the Cossack outposts? 10. Traces of Tartaria on maps Surprisingly, in most European languages, Tartars are known with letter P as Tartars, remember at least Tartar meat and Tartar sauce with the same name, and only we have lost the extra letter somewhere. And now compare this with hundreds of maps, which simply scream about Tartary, and its territories do not coincide with the assumed field of action of the Horde. The main cities of this power, according to the maps, were located in the Far East, and for example the Arctic Ocean is called Tartary Sea. Tartary also included, judging by maps, European Russia, called Moscow Tartary, and the vast territories of Central Asia India and China, independent and Chinese Tartary. By the way, in India, which just corresponds to the location of the independent Tartary at this time ruled by some great moguls, strangely consonant with the Mongols. If you were interested, thank the author by putting a like. And also do not forget to subscribe so as not to miss the outputs of even more interesting videos of my channel. Turn on notifications by clicking on the bell and share this video with your friends. What else interesting can you add to this video? Write in the comments, it will be interesting to read.